So Psalm 37, a very well-known psalm. There's lots of hymns about it. It is a psalm of David. And it's a psalm like I think the first psalm we did together in the series was on Psalm 1. And Psalm 1 was ostensibly about the destiny of the wicked and the righteous. And this is a theme that's repeated again in Psalm 37. When you read this psalm, it's, it's interesting because the psalms, of course, were used for worship in Israel. And it's, when you read the psalm, it, it reads more like Prov the book of Proverbs to me than it does the psalms. It's a psalm of instruction. So many of the psalms were put to music and used in the temple service in Israel. This is a psalm of instruction because it repeats an idea over and over again, just like the book of Proverbs. David wants us to get it into our minds. And so the same theme keeps reoccurring. He visits the destiny of the righteous and the destiny of the wicked. And he does it over and over again in this psalm. Because we're so, we so readily forget in our day-to-day -day life that there is a distinction that God makes between those who serve him and those who don't. One of the problems we have in our world now is that people don't think there is any distinction between really good and evil. It's whatever you feel like, pretty much, is the way you should go, and you determine what's right and what's wrong. You never get that impression from reading this psalm. You distinctly get the impression that God determines what is correct behaviour and what is not. I've written down, it's better for us to be occupied with doing good than to spend our time worrying over other people doing evil. And that's what David is trying to tell us. Because we, be, we can become so consumed with what other people do, we can forget to do what God wants us to do. And that is doing good. And this is the, the question that David addresses. What to do with your life? Now, when you look at the life of David, he could have fretted time and time again over what other people were doing. Because he was surrounded by people often doing the wrong thing. And he could have focused on that. But he didn't. He focused on God and what God wanted him to do. And we'll see that as, as we, we go through the psalm. So he says, don't fret yourself because of evildoers. Don't be envious of wrongdoers. Why? Because they're not here for very long, is his point. They're not part of God's plan. They will never be part of God's eternal plan because they don't want to belong to God. So they're only short term. They're only here for a while. Now, I've, I've written a number of proverbs in my margin that relate directly to this. And, and one of them's my, my favorite. One of the favorites I try and carry around in my head because I find it very helpful. Proverbs 23 verses 17 and 18. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Why? Verse 18. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. It's one of those problems I find helpful because in today's world, what we find is a world based on envy. We live in a society which makes money out of getting people to be envious. The whole marketing strategy is to get you to want what other people have got or to get you to be jealous of what other people have. Um, we now have this incredible phenomena that we never had before the internet of influences. And um, 
generally most of them are, are about as deep as a teaspoon and they influence that's the whole idea they influence other people so they have hundreds of thousands even millions of followers and the whole idea is you become envious of what they have and their lifestyle never mind the fact that often they're exposed as being fake and they're taking photos of on holidays they never went on or restaurants they never ate in it doesn't matter it's just up there for you to see and become envious of and so that's the way a lot of people live they live their life on a phone or a tablet or whatever other means they've got of electronic communication and they scroll through and they look at other people doing all these wonderful things and they become envious of their lifestyle it's a very different world to the world David lived in, obviously. He lived in Israel. They never had such things then. But human nature hasn't changed. Envy has always been part of human nature. Human nature. So he says, don't fret yourself over this stuff. Don't be envious. They're only here for a little while. They're not here for the long term. This is the only opportunity the wicked are going to get to have anything. Think about it. They're not with God, so the only opportunity they have of accruing anything in terms of this world's wealth and lifestyle is now. And if they didn't get it now, they're never going to get it. And whatever they get now is only for now. It has no enduring substance it is fleeting so he says they will soon fade like the grass and one of the great chapters of isaiah comes to mind with that phrase fading like the grass is isaiah chapter 40 where isaiah 40 says all flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field the grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And there's the distinction between those that are like grass and will not endure. It's interesting, of course, that we looked at Psalm 1 in our first Psalms class and it talked about the righteous being like a tree. They're planted, they have depth, and they grow. And there's a great contrast between the tree of the righteous and the grass of the wicked. The wicked are fleeting. So, okay, if, if we're not going to spend our life, you know, envying the wicked, getting on... Um, Facebook and Instagram and whatever else it is I'm supposed to get onto and scroll through every day and see all these people living fabulous lives. What am I going to do with my life? What is the point of my existence? Well, David tells us in, in verse three, he says, trust in the Lord, trust in Yahweh and do good. You know, ostensibly discipleship is about doing good. It's not about not doing bad things. It's about doing good things. The parable of Jesus comes to mind when he talked about the woman who swept out the house and left it empty. And then he said, afterwards, seven devils came in and the house of that, the state of that house was worse than the first had it, it had been at the beginning. So he says, look, there's two things you've got to do. Trust God. So know where to put your life. Know who your life belongs to. It belongs to God. Put your trust in God and don't sit around waiting for something to happen. Do good. It says of Jesus in Acts chapter 10 that he went about doing good and healing the sick and all those who were oppressed of, of devils, demons. That's, this is based on the life of Jesus. His was not a negative 
purity. Can you imagine what it would have been like for Jesus if he just sat around thinking, I, I can't do the wrong thing? You can't live your life like that. You have to be doing something positive. So he says, trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, and befriend faithfulness. It's, it's very interesting that when you go through this psalm, it is deeply rooted in the promises that God gave to Abraham. It's all about the land. In fact, when, when you go through, and I've coloured them in in my Bible, you can go through and there's eight times where it talks about dwelling in or inheriting the land. This is David reiterating the promises God gave to Abraham because his kingship was dependent on the same promises. And he knew the land. But it's not just the land of Israel he's talking about. He's not just talking about the generation of Israel that were living then. He's talking about this as an inter eternal inheritance. He's talking about everybody who puts their trust in God will dwell in the land. And, of course, that's the promise God gave to Abraham. So Paul picks it up in Galatians chapter 3 and says, if you are Abraham's seed, then you are heirs according to the promise. And it doesn't matter your nationality, your background. So David says, for us now, right now, we're, we're heirs of the same promise. What are you going to do with your life? How do you live your life? You live your life trusting God and doing good. That phrase, bef befriend uh, faithfulness, is interesting. I've got the um, complete Jewish Bible here, which I like to use on occasion. And in the complete Jewish Bible, it says, feed on faithfulness. And I like that. It's the idea of sustaining yourself, feeding on faithfulness, feeding on God, because God is faithfulness. More than that, he says, delight yourself in the Lord. Find, find delight in God. Again, that, that takes us back to Psalm 1, which we, we looked at, where it says in Psalm 1 that the godly man delights in the law of Yahweh. So he, he delights in the things of God. So what he's talking about here is a fullness of life, a life that is brimming with God, not, not, not stingy in the way we approach God, not, not minimalist in our approach to God and what he's done for us. We sometimes find our, ourselves in life thinking, oh, this is all I need to do to serve God. You don't get that impression from reading this psalm. What you get is the idea that David is talking about filling yourself up to the brim with God and his ways. And it doesn't leave room then to envy what other people are doing. Your life is too full of doing God's things. It's too full of living God's ways to even worry about what other people think about your life or what they have or haven't got. It doesn't matter. And when you see somebody who is like that, whose life is, is brimming with God, who's feeding on faithfulness, you notice their attitude is different. They really don't care what other people think. They don't care about what other people think about their job or the car they drive or the house they live in. It doesn't matter. It's not on the priority, top of the priority list. Jesus talked about, about the Gentiles. He said, don't worry so much about all the stuff they worry about. God knows you need that stuff. He said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is the idea that David's presenting here. Fill yourself up with God and the other stuff will recede into the background. It doesn't matter. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. I said that this, this reminds me of the Proverbs, and it's very much like the Proverbs. And we know these verses in Proverbs really well, but again, it's, it's good counsel from the Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. 
And that's what David's saying here. And of course, the Proverbs are written by Solomon, the son of the son of David. You know, many of the events, events in David's life, as I said, would find some expression. If we go back through David's life, we would find an underlying association out of this psalm with events. But one of them I've written in my margin here when it talks about committing your way to the Lord. I want us to come back just to 1 Samuel 30 for a moment. And in 1 Samuel 30, we have the very dramatic event of when... Um, David comes back to Ziklag. It wasn't the best time of David's life. He was he was um, down in the south of the land. He'd been conducting raids with his band of men, and um, he'd been rejected by by the Philistines in in First Samuel twenty nine, and they'd made their base camp in Ziklag. And it says in 1 Samuel 30, verse 1, Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They'd overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, their wives and their sons and their daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. What does David do? What's his response? Well, here's, here's Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. So David, it says, strengthened himself in Yahweh his God. He had no other option. They were bitter in soul, and it looked like David had deserted him, and it, and it almost looked, I think, this is a bad time in David's life. I think David suffered with depression in this period of his life. He was depressed. He wasn't acting in the best character in this period of his life. And he was feeling dejected. And this could have gone the other way. This could have tipped David over the balance to reject God and say, well, look at this. He's promised me the kingdom. He promised that I would be the king of Israel. I'm in the anointed. And what's happened? Now I've lost everything. And we can sometimes get to that point in our life where we feel like God's deserted us and we, we've been left alone. Well, David took this scene in and he stood back and he said, I've only got one option. And he strengthened himself in Yahweh's God. And that's what he says here in this verse. He committed his way to his God. He could have gone the other way, but he didn't. And look what he said in verse six. He will bring forth your righteousness at the light and your justice as the noonday. And he eventually did do that in the life of David. He eventually established David as king and he brought forth David's righteousness. But it may not have been that way had David not committed himself to his God, had he lost the plot. It reminds me of um, 1 Peter 5. Come, Just come to 1 Peter 5 for a moment. And we know when Peter wrote this letter to the diaspora, they were su are suffering persecution. But in 1 Peter 5, verse 6, he says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. And the proper time for our exaltation won't come now. It won't be now. It will only be with the return of the Lord that the proper time for exaltation comes. We... we we can't expect to be exalted now. Now is our time of learning. Now, about, now is our time of submitting and committing ourselves to God. This is where our character is developed in, the, in the, the hard days of life, when the difficult decisions have to be made as to whether I follow God or I don't. Our exaltation is not for now. 
But he says this in verse 7. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So what do you do with all your anxieties? Or your anxiousness? You cast it on God. And in due course, exaltation will come. But we can't expect it. Now. And so David did do that. And he says in verse 7 of Psalm 37, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. I think the last psalm we looked at together was Psalm 46 when it said, be still and know that I am God. And so often you find this as counsel in the word of God, just to be still, to reflect. It's difficult to be still in today's world. Everything keeps moving, doesn't it? Everything is so fast paced. Everything is momentary. It's transitory. And he says, just be still and wait patiently for him. That's a religious exercise. Waiting is a religious exercise. Psalm 62, David says in verse one, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. The idea of waiting, the Hebrew word quava, it means to bind together. You think about a rope that's bound, there's strands of a rope that are bound together to make it strong. If it's one strand, it ain't so strong. But if it's three strands, it's much stronger. And the idea of this is the body of Christ. You know, if we had to wait alone, how many of us would keep waiting? If God asked us to do this exercise as a solitary individual, we'd give up. But we're not a solitary individual. We're part of a body. And that's the point. Our strength is in unity, in being together and encouraging each other to wait for God. He says, don't fret yourself over somebody that prospers in their way, over the man that carries out evil devices. His prosperity is short-lived because it's not God's way. It'll be here and it, it will be gone. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do you remember when David, again in that, period of his life when he was down with his I keep wanting to say merry men but I don't think they were so merry often not when they wanted to stone him certainly they weren't merry men but when he was down with his band of um, discontents and they'd been looking after Nabal's sheep and then David had the audacity to send his men and ask for some provisions and Nabal was outraged and said, who's this David? There's a lot of servants running away from their masters these days. And David was so incensed at the way Nabal treated his men. He said, and that's enough. And they, they put on their swords and they were going to ride over and just going to kill Nabal and everything belonged to him. And if it hadn't have been for the woman of beautiful countenance, Abigail, who stopped him in his tracks, who met him on the way and said to him, David, you're a better man than this. God has promised you the kingdom and God is faithful to his promises. And it was the wise counsel of Abigail that stopped David because verse 7 says, don't fret yourself or get yourself all head up over one who prospers in his way. That, that's Nabal right there because Nabal was a very rich man and David looked at what Nabal had and he said, I only want a little bit of it for me and my men and this man won't give me anything. So he was fretting over it. He got himself hot under the collar and it was Abigail that stopped him from committing a heinous sin. And verse 8 says, refrain from anger and forsake wrath fret not yourself it only tends to evil and it would have in that, on that occasion 
He would have slain Nabal in his whole household and he would have regretted it for the rest of his life. So he knew what he was talking about when he says, don't get yourself wound up over evil men, over men who appear to prosper. For the evil deals will be cut off, but those who inherit, who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And of course, Nabal was cut off very quickly when he found out that Abigail had taken out so much of his provisions and given it to David and his men, it says he died of a heart attack. He was so stingy. He died. So he was cut off very quickly. Years later, when David sat on the throne in Jerusalem, it says in 2 Samuel that when David sat on the throne, he perceived that God had made him king over Israel. In other words, he understood that everything he'd gone through was for the benefit of God's people, that God was testing his character and he was refining his character so that he was the right man to sit on the throne of Israel. He said, just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundance of peace. There's what Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And people say, well, the meek don't inherit anything. It's the strong who inherit the earth. No, they don't. They don't inherit the earth. You think of all the people, the the, uh, the kings, the army generals, the Saddam Husseins and guys like that. What have they inherited? Absolutely zero. Nothing. They don't inherit the earth. They inherit enough for someone to put them in a pine box, a wooden overcoat, as we say, and drop them in the ground. And they go back to where they came from. That's all they get. They don't inherit the earth. Jesus is always right. Because you notice it says, when the meek inherit the earth, they will delight themselves in the abundance of peace. That is not what we see now. We don't see peace now. This is clearly tied to the Abrahamic covenant because it's only when that covenant is realized that there will be peace. So it's clearly talking about the kingdom that God promised to Abraham. The wicked, he says, plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. And you ask yourself the question, why is it? You think about it. Why do the wicked get so agitated by righteous people. Why is it that we can express an opinion on something that is, is godly and we can use the word of God and people get so agitated by it? So agitated they will gnash their teeth at you. I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I have. I've expressed something from the Bible and I've had people absolutely explode at me over it. I think it goes back to Genesis. You know, Genesis 3, what did God say? He said there would be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. There will always be enmity between the two seeds on this earth. The wicked plot against the righteous. That's what they did with Jesus. They couldn't stand him. They couldn't stand the uprightness of his character, so they plotted against him to kill him because the very way he lived was a condemnation of their whole attitude and the way they lived. And they gnashed their teeth at him. What's God's response to that? He says, the Lord laughs at the wicked for he sees that his day is coming. We looked at Psalm 2 in one of the other classes where it says, God will have them in derision. He will laugh at them because they have no power. The only power they have has been given by him to, to bring about his purpose. It won't stop them plotting because it talks about the wicked drawing their, their sword, bending their bow, bringing down the poor and the needy, slaying those whose way is upright. 
you think about Ahab and um, Naboth. Naboth couldn't get what he, oh, sorry, Ahab couldn't get what he wanted. So he, he, he devises a plot against Naboth. He gets men to falsely accuse Naboth and then he gets him killed. Typical of the way the wicked behave against the righteous. But it says their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. Think in your mind of what happened in the book of Esther. Haman the Agagite. He sought to have the Jews killed. He built a, a gallows 75 feet high. And who ended up on it? Naaman the Agagite. He plotted against the righteous, Mordecai and Esther. And his sword, in the terms of Psalm 37, his sword came back on him, himself. The sword entered his own heart. Better is a little that the righteous has, verse 16 says, than the abundance of many wicked. Paul says to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Again, I've got a, a, a proverb um, in my margin written next to this one, and, and it's Proverbs 17, verse 1, which says, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. And isn't that true? Oh, that always makes me think of the of, of taking a, the bread on a Sunday morning in quiet reflection. Better it is to eat the bread of the sacrifice of the Lord than to have a house full of feasting or abundance. And it's interesting, that word abundance there, I've, I'm using ESV, but the idea is of, is of tumult. It's better to have a little with righteousness than to have a lot with trouble. And you look at the wicked and they might have abundance, but there's an awful lot of trouble comes with it. They might drive around in their fast cars. I was thinking of all the, the shootings we've had in Sydney recently, and it always seems to me that these gangsters always seem to live in flash houses and drive flash cars, but look how they end up. There's a lot of tumult, a lot of tumult. It's not worth it, is what David's saying. It's just not worth it. They're here and they're gone because that's the way, the way they live. They live fast and furious and then they're gone. He says, the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. I've written a question in my margin. If the Lord upholds the righteous, who upholds the wicked? Who is it that, that's backing the wicked? You know who often it is? It's their mates. But when things go bad, they turn it against them pretty rapidly. If you're in with bad people, be assured of this, it's not going to end well. God will uphold the righteous, but if you're with the wicked, it's only got one outcome. God knows the days of the blameless and their heritage will remain forever. And there's the contrast. The wicked are here and gone. The heritage of those who God knows will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil days. In the days of famine, they have abundance. I should have said at the beginning, this is an acrostic psalm. For those of you who know what an acrostic psalm is, and probably you all do, there's a number of acrostic psalms. The most, the most famous acrostic psalm is Psalm 119. An acrostic psalm is a psalm where each stanza of the psalm starts with a, a consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 uh, um, letters in the Hebrew alphabet. This is an acrostic right through the Hebrew alphabet except for one verse, and that's verse 28 where the, the letter A should be, and it's not there, but various commentators can work their way around that. I'm not an expert on it, so we'll leave that to them. But it is an acrostic psalm, and acrostic psalms were very valuable ways of teaching people so that you knew that each stanza that was coming was another letter of the alphabet. It was a good memory aid. He talks about the wicked perishing and going up like smoke as jesus says like the grass of the field verse 21 is interesting it says the wicked borrows but does not pay back 
but the righteous is generous and gives. So the, the idea is the wicked take and the righteous give. That's what the, it said earlier in the psalm. Do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. So the wicked will take, but they won't give. The righteous give and don't expect to receive it. And that's what, again, this is the teaching of Jesus. He says, give to men good measure. Don't be stingy. Be overflowing. Fill it up to the brim so that it overflows. Be generous like God is generous. God is generous to us, more than generous. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong. In other words, we will all fall. All of us fail. All of us make mistakes. Don't let that be the end of you, is the idea. Don't make a mistake and say, well, that's it. I'm finished. You will recover. The righteous man gets up seven times a day, says Proverbs. If he falls down seven times, he gets up seven times a day. Get up and keep going. Why? Because the Lord upholds his hand. So remember that when we're walking in our walk, God is walking with us. We're not doing this alone. We're doing it with each other, but we're also doing it with God. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says this, Fear not, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's what he did for David. And he will do it for all of those who put their trust in him. David says, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. And that's what we're told. Be generous toward God and God will bless you. That was one of the problems Israel had. You, you read the book of Malachi. They were stingy toward God. They wanted to bring animals to sacrifice that were three-legged and had all sorts of disease and blemishes. And God said, well, you wouldn't take it to your boss, to your governor. Why are you bringing it to me? He said, no, you'd be generous toward God and God is generous toward you. Even the little that a righteous man has, he's prepared to lend or to give. Verse 27, he says, turn away from evil and do good. So again, it's the idea of not just turning away from the bad stuff. It's about doing the good things. So shall you dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. There again is a reiteration of the promise to Abraham. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. Psalm 119 verse 11. Psalm 119 is just a phenomenal psalm. I mean... There's only two verses in Psalm 119 that don't mention the word of God. All the way through, it's about the word, the word, the word, the word, the word, all the way through. And one of those verses is one of the verses that mentions the word of God. Verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And there's the life of Jesus right there. He stored up the word of God in his heart that he wouldn't sin against his father. The law of God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. One of the other Psalms I was thinking of doing was Psalm 73, which is the opposite really to this Psalm. It's the Psalm of Asaph where he says, my foot had almost slipped. And the reason his foot almost slipped is because he got further and further away from God. He'd lost his perspective. And David says, if the law of God is in your heart, if you're up close and personal with the, the law of God, your foot doesn't slip. It's when you're getting further and further away from God that your foot slips. You lose your footing and you lose your sense of direction. 
Verse 32 says, the wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. Just come over to Mark chapter 2. Sorry, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verse 2 or verse 1. Again, he entered the synagogue and there was a man there with a withered hand and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Here's the classic example of this verse. Here is the wicked watching for the righteous. You know, when we read Psalm 30, 37, we understand when it talks about the righteous, it's talking about people who are generally godly in their behaviour. But in this verse, when it, when it talks about the righteous, we can very, very easily transpose that into the life of our Lord because in truth, he was the only one that was righteous. The only one that was righteous was the Lord. And here in Mark chapter 3, it was the wicked watching the righteous, as in Jesus Christ, and they wanted to accuse him. And, of course, he heals the man with the withered hand. But he was very angry at the people. It says in verse 5, he looked around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. And that's straight out of Psalm 37, verse 32. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. What's God's response to that? Verse 33. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Now, Jesus was condemned by the wicked and the ungodly at his trial. But God did not abandon his son because we know that Psalm 16 says he will not abandon his, his soul to Sheol. The father didn't abandon him. He raised him from the dead, even though for a short time the wicked thought they'd had a victory against the Son of God. Then he says in verse 34, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on where the wicked, you will look on when the wicked are cut off. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree. Uh, in my margin, it says the identity of this tree is uncertain. I tried to look it up because I wasn't sure, and I like trees. I couldn't really find out what it was, but it seems to say in the Hebrew, I've seen the wicked spreading himself like a, a tree in its native soil is one interpretation of it. The idea is that, that, that this particular tree, it's not the tree of the righteous, it's a tree that flourishes in its own native environment. And when you put that in the context of the wicked, you can understand what he's saying. So the wicked flourish in the here and now environment. You know, they, they flourish in this short-term world. So they're involved in all sorts of crooked dealing and they're messing around with the wrong people and they appear to flourish. But it's only for a time. It's only for a very short time. And they are gone. They flourished in their native soil and they're gone. It says in verse 36, but he passed away and behold, he was no more. Though I saw him, he could not be found. I thought of um, Kerry Packer. Some of you wouldn't remember Kerry Packer because he's no longer here. <laughs> he's gone. But... Um, Terry Packer was the kind of guy who flourished in his native soil, you know. He, he made a lot of money. He lived and he, his life was over at the age of 62. And I think about that and I think I've lived longer in this life now than Kerry Packer lived. He might have had uh, how many billions of dollars, he flourished in his native soil and he's gone and he's buried somewhere up in the Hunter Valley and he will never see the light of day again. Do you remember when he had that heart attack and he, and he 
he reckons he died for a moment. And he, ca he came back and he said, I've got news for you. There's no heaven and there's no hell. There's no devil. When you're gone, you're gone. Well, for him, that's true. He's right. He's 100% right. He's gone. Gone for good. So he flows for a while and he's gone for good. And that's what David says. I've seen people, and this was in his, his days in Israel. He saw people in his own nation flourishing for a while and they were wicked and they were gone. I love Psalm 49. Just, just come to Psalm 49. Because Psalm 49 is a psalm of the sons of Korah, and it's a brilliant psalm. But they say this, verse 16, Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases, for when he dies he will carry nothing away. There's that saying that, that people say, you know, they say you never see a, a, um, a hearse going to a, a, a cemetery with a luggage rack on. You ever heard that? <laughs> Why not? Because they can't take anything with them. It's true. They still can't take any, anything with them. You don't see them with a luggage rack. The only thing in a hearse is a coffin because they're not going anywhere. And that's what they said. He won't take anything with him. His gl the glory of his house might increase, but when he dies, he will carry nothing away. Though he, while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. And so true it is, as David says. They're here and then they're gone. In contrast to that, he said, I want you now to look at the blameless man. You've looked at the wicked, the one who flourished in his native soil, and he looked like he was going really, really well. Like the parable that Jesus told about the, the man who built bigger and better barns, and he said, look, I've, got, I've stored up for many years to come. Soul, take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. You've got yourself sorted out. And God says, you fool, this night you will die. And he's gone. He's finished. And then David says, well, I want you now to cast your gaze somewhere else. Don't look at the wicked, because when he's gone, you won't find him. Look at verse 37. Mark the blameless and behold the upright. For there is a future for the man of peace. And, of course, there was only one upright, blameless man, and that was Jesus. Consider where he is. Is he gone? No, not at all. He's not on earth at the moment, but he's not gone. He's alive forever. He's the complete contrast to the wicked that have come and gone and will never be seen again. Not only is he alive, he's alive forever, and he's controlling the events that are going on in the world now. There is a future for the man of peace. Well, the future, of course, for Jesus is to be king of the world reigning from Jerusalem. And our future is tied up inextricably bound like that cord. Our future is bound in the hope of the resurrection with the Son of God. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. So I've written in my, my margin, to the wicked is destruction, to the righteous is deliverance. Yes, we will go through the trouble. Yes, we will find hard times, but we're on God's side. We will be delivered. Verse 39, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. We know the righteous know where to put their trust. They know who to rely on. The Lord helps and delivers them. David knew this from personal experience. How many times did God deliver David? Over and over again, God delivered David. Even from his own stupidity at times, God delivered him. Think about the man Daniel. In, thrown in the, the den of lions. Who delivered him? Who was his stronghold? God shuts the, the lion's mouth. 
you go through, and this verse applies over and over again in the Bible to the faithful servants of God. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. It ends the same way as, as Psalm 2. Blessed are all they who take refuge in him. So I hope that we can see from looking at Psalm 37 that we're not promised exaltation now. We're not promised that life will be easy as the saints of God. What we are promised is inheritance in the land forever. Not short term, forever. Based on the promises that God gave to Abraham so long ago and the same promises that the faithful have put the anchor of their soul in that were fulfilled in Jesus and will be realized when he comes again, when at last the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I'm going to read as a final verse from Revelation 14. Revelation 14 verse 12 says this, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. 